Trick or treat! Kara! Zeppelin! I clean my costume. That's what the bucket's for, you moron. Trick or treaters! What fine costumes you're wearing, kids! I see a little werewolf there. Have some candy. Thanks, mister! Oh, look at that, an Iron Man! Your parents don't love you enough to make a costume for you, huh, kid? <laughs> That's really a shame. What a cheapskate. Get the toilet paper stand. A pirate. Oh, that's a new one. Here you go. A ah, Clark bar. I got a can of cream tomato soup. Nipsey Russell, what a great costume, kid. Have some candy. Hey, thanks, mister. Toilet paper mummy, always a classic. Here you go. Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh, boy. Trick or treat. Trick -or -treat. What are you two supposed to be? I'm Bryce Diener. And I'm Sam Tyler. From Book Reports Podcast. Get out of here. Welcome to Blue Reports Podcast Halloween Special, where we are discussing the ghastliest grimoires, the most terrifying tales, and the pants wetting as pamphlets. Joined as always, I am here with Bryce Diener. And I'm with Sam. I, we yes. We've never introduced <laughs> each other before. <laughs> Trick or treat, sucker. Trick or treat. <laughs> Trick or treat. Yeah. I'll just introduce myself. Caleb Swartz, thank you all. Wow, taking the reins. Oh, my goodness. What a ghastly little goblin. It's a character flaw, but I leverage it well. Yeah, when you knocked on the door and said trick or treat, we decided to give you both by making you a guest on the podcast. Yeah. And I brought the promise of candy, but psych didn't bring any. Oh! <laughs> also, I set your mailboxes on fire. <laughs> what a door. Trickster. So as this is a Halloween special, mm -hmm. were you allowed to celebrate Halloween as a kid? We were. What did you guys do? I lived out in the middle of nowhere. So the extent of our <laughs> trick-or-treating was hopping in a car and driving to our in-laws where they would give us candy <laughs> and then we would return home. And it took probably about an hour and a half to get to five different houses. So the loot was not good. But did they make up for it by really getting like high quality candy or was it still just a Tootsie Roll and a kiss? I Thanks, <laughs> Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to remember going to my grandparents and they would give us work vouchers, actually, which was an opportunity for us to work for them later. <laughs> uh, it's like reverse trick-or-treating. We didn't actually get anything out of it. They the got toilet it. paper from the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So the whole trick-or-treating culture was really lost on me until uh, later in, in my childhood when okay. I was able to go with friends to towns. How about you, Bryce? Were you allowed to celebrate Halloween? I was not. What did you do as a Christian family alternative? Stayed home. Oh. Fifth or sixth grade, my one classmate had me over, and they're like, it's Halloween, why don't we go out trick-or-treating? You know, I'm just over mm -hmm. there hanging out at their house, having not celebrated. I'm like, I guess I can go home and put a costume together. <laughs> so <laughs> innocently, too. Yeah. So I found a green shirt and green sweatpants, and every single house, I had to explain, I'm an army man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was given an hour's notice. I apologize. <laughs> you could at least have found a gun to carry around. I mean, come on, it's Pennsylvania. I'm just laying around. I'm an army man. Oh, that's and they, so sad. The f I'm a green crayon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pickle. <laughs> you could have come up with so many options. I'm the Incredible Hulk <laughs> yes. without any clothes on. Yeah. Oh, you were getting sympathy candy, man. That's, well, yeah. yeah. At that point. Mm -hmm. Looking at their faces and their disappointment, it's like, you could have tried better, kid. <laughs> like, yeah, I probably could have. <laughs> Look at that. You stumbled into a strategy for candy collection mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. Children spent time researching, and you just happened upon it. You're a natural. <laughs> what about you, Sam? Did you? I was not allowed to celebrate Halloween. I trick or treated twice in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I think once when I was five, and once when I was a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. For the most part, we weren't allowed to. I just kind of quietly watched movies and, and read spooky books on Halloween, trying to celebrate what vestiges of my favorite holiday I could. I'm, I'm a big it, fan of Halloween. Is it actually your favorite holiday? It's be between that and Christmas. They're both pretty fantastic. Well, and my birthday, I suppose. The, the national holiday that it is. Uh, yeah, the post office closes on my birthday every single year. It's, it's very important. It's such a great holiday. I genuinely love Halloween. There's lots of things that I enjoy. Monsters, folklore, that just kind of come together at Halloween. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've read that has actually scared you? I was a huge R.L. Stein Choose Your Own Adventure <laughs> book reader in my youth. And uh, some of those stories still haunt me to this day. Oh, anyone in particular that's just stuck in your head? The one about the puppet. Yeah, Slappy's uh, awful. Slappy, yeah. Yes. Slappy the puppet always scared me to death. Those covers are absolutely terrifying. They were. That's Goosebumps. Yeah, Goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so allowed to read those. 
There's a reason. It warped me. <laughs> me neither. I did read some. <laughs> yeah. And so I would read through the book and choose the next step and it'd go to the next yeah. step and it would get too scary. So I'd go back and make the other oh, choice. Oh, would you? I, I never read any of the Goosebumps Choose Your Own Adventures. Did they actually end with like kids dying or were they more of like, because, because the actual Goosebumps books were just sort of like subtle hints that something bad's about to happen to the kid. No, I don't think so. I, how, I don't how think, how think any, I think they mean. always ended up okay, but they were always left with like little cliffhangers. Right. Yeah. Of, you don't actually know what happened after <laughs> they walked out of the house. <laughs> You know, because, like, it'll be like, and a new family moved into the home. Oh, like, sure, sure, oh, sure. no, it's going to start all over again. <laughs> and they're not going to make it. Because I'm not reading it for them. <laughs> yeah, that was about the only one I can remember really scaring me. I was never really much into the horror, you know, suspense scene. So I, I, was, I was always more fantasy and fiction and, okay, okay. and fun and lightheartedness and good guys winning. In the 90s, there's a, a few very interesting sets of books where the premises, if you think about it, are really horrifying. Mm. Like the boxcar children. They're basically a bunch of homeless children <laughs> who have to take care of themselves with no adults. <laughs> Something absolutely terrifying I is think they tried that, that in Lord of the Flies, too. That's exactly right. <laughs> the conch shell children. children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Bryce? Is there anything terrifying recently? For Book Report podcast, I think probably the most scary thing was In Cold Blood. What was it, again, about just the, the fact that it was true. It, it was a, a family on a farm. Mm. There was a nasty rumor that they had a big safe full of money. A couple of guys who were working the farm decided, let's show up at like 5 a.m. and tie them up, find the safe. Oh, there's no safe? Okay, let's kill them. I think that was episode mm. three? Something like that, Something yeah. Like that? Yeah, it's one of our earlier episodes. Okay. So the last thing to scare Bryce was <laughs> at, back in episode three. So listeners, if you want to scare Bryce, he is due for a <laughs> horrifying shot. His guard is down. <laughs> <laughs> He's been far too happy recently. We need, to, we need to take care of that. That's for sure. Okay, that's good. I wanted to ask you, Caleb, <coughs> yeah. growing up on a farm. We had growing... no money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the safe? Where's the safe? <laughs> There's not. There's no money. So, listeners, I think the scariest thing that Book Reports Podcast can provide is a terrible author. And lucky for you, on our scary episode, I found one. Oh. Not intentionally, she just turned out that way. That's right, she. Welcome to 2018, everybody. <laughs> we can hate women authors, too. The quality just, has been reached. Just as equally. <laughs> I was worried that Wes Moore didn't have any friends in the I don't like this book category. <laughs> we'll worry no longer, Wes Moore. <laughs> There's a second plaque on Bryce's wall. That's right. <laughs> Lost Loot, Ghostly New England Treasure Tales by Patricia Hughes is a terrible book. If you find it, don't get it. The end. <laughs> now, now, Bryce, I understand you basically took this landmine for me because this is a book I was thinking about yes. picking up at a library book sale we were both at. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so yeah. I appreciate that very, very You're much. Welcome. Yeah, I, very, I, very much. I deserve the Book Medal of Honor uh, <laughs> for falling on this grenade. For valiant <laughs> service. <laughs> yeah. So it's like book it, but for heroes. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't made this joke in a while that the real treasure was friendship. That's not true in this book. There's nowhere that I can even place that joke. Lost loot. Hardly ever mentioned. Ghostly New England Treasure Tales. Well, it's tales. lost, so it's not in the book. That's it's true. right there in the title, Bryce. Is it the reader's expecting. responsibility to find it then? <laughs> she does go into great detail about where maybe treasure happened to be buried. But it's a you know, side mess. Like, she buried the lead when she's talking about New England. She'd much rather talk about the islands off the coast of New England than she would ghostly tales, which hardly ever get mentioned, the ghosts. Aww. And Lost Loot is barely ever mentioned either. So, if you were to put the title of this book in the correct order, what would the title then be? Islands off the coast of New England. <laughs> <laughs> what was, in fact, in this book? What was it about, matter of fact? So, I won't give specific examples, but I doubt she had an editor. There's a lot of, like, the homonyms, like where one word is spelled differently, mm -hmm. and so spell check's not going to get it. You know, we went through the passageway. We went though the passageway, is what she wrote. Oh. Ooh. I was like, hmm, an editor should have caught that. Mm -hmm. Right. Also, I'm going to give an example later of how she screwed up the tides to talk about islands. So, the beginning of the book, she goes into the different pirates that were around the area at the time. Okay. Not when she was writing the book, but <laughs> when the book is set. <laughs> My neighbor keeps downloading stuff illegally on the internet. <laughs> There's so many pirates in New England. <laughs> <laughs> 
she's like talking about the pirates that are around this time. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a chapter on Captain Kidd. Nice. And so let me just share a quick excerpt of how she ruined a good story. Oh, oh. Captain Kidd was said to have visited many of the main islands in his travels. His treasure is said to be buried on Orr's Island, Bailey's Island, Two Bush Island, Codhead Marsh, Hollow Island, Pittston Island, Squirrel Island, Isla Haunt, Mahogany Island, Prospect Island, Stony Brook Island, Heart Island, Jewel Island, and Appledore Island. Like for paragraphs, she just uh -huh. lists islands. Mm. It's like stop it. So that was a I don't know. I thought that was a fairly interesting list of islands. Does that just happen repeatedly? So you're yes, tired of it? It does. Okay. It's mostly even northern New England. Like she doesn't even go all of New England. Like you don't get anything from Vermont. She'll just go state by state. I'm like, hey, listen to all these islands. There's a chapter later where she just lists each island and maybe why it's significant. One is like Duck Island. Maybe Captain Kidd buried treasure here, and that's the entire story of Duck Island. Does it's she? Like, why do you even mention it? She doesn't well, raise any proof. No, she doesn't. Well, if you could raise proof that there is treasure on the island, right. you'd want the treasure <laughs> first. I just yes. want to warn you, Bryce, because you hate this book... I'm play devil's advocate, despite having never read it, to try to find the best things about it for the okay. rest of this discussion. I hope you don't mind. So what is the best thing she has to say about Captain Kidd? Did you learn anything about Captain Kidd that was interesting from this book? No, because she doesn't really talk about him. So it's, it's his treasure? Does she talk about the loot? She talks about Maine. <laughs> <laughs> the true the treasure, the treasure the of Maine. the people of Maine. <laughs> the fact that Captain Kidd happened to be there and created history there is a side story that happens to accidentally get mentioned by Patricia. It so what does she say about Maine? It turns out the real treasure was lobster traps. <laughs> <laughs> and bisque. <laughs> Red gold. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then I think she'd actually stumble across a good... How long was this book? Scary story. Story. This is a... Uh, 220 pages or something like that. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so the first yeah. half is all about Maine and pirates that don't have anything to do with Maine. Pirates who don't have anything to do with Maine <laughs> is not the VeggieTales song, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we are the pirates who have nothing <laughs> to do, do with, with Maine. Maine. <laughs> <laughs> Please stay home. Yeah. And don't talk about Maine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, where did she get her information? She's from New England, so let me read the about the author in front of the book. She definitely wrote it herself, and again, no editor. Patricia Hughes was born... Is a very pretty woman <laughs> who loves everybody and is loved by all. She's a paragon and a very good writer. And the and world's and best author. <laughs> And has Every, a and knack for the perfect macaroons. <laughs> <laughs> John Travolta always said he's the only woman he ever loved. <laughs> Patricia Hughes was born and raised in New England, now living in rural Maine. Shocker. She enjoys the spirit of the entire region, which truly can be found outdoors in the extensive islands and tremendous mountains. Exploring the treasure, rich, and mysterious history of New England is just one more excuse she can use to play outside in any season. <laughs> like the last half of that kind of sounded like the description of somebody in like a calendar or something. Well, it was the same bio she yeah. took from their local volunteer fire, fire, fire department's <laughs> calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I will share one of the interesting stories that she included. There was a Spanish galley that crashed off the coast, and then you know, there was a treasure that was found with Spanish coins in it, but because it was haunted for whatever reason, whoever possessed the coins would have bad luck. Was the bad luck that no bank could exchange it for yeah. like, actual dollars? <laughs> yes. Ah, oh, the curse strikes again! <laughs> <laughs> no McDonald's will take his money! Ooh! The soda machine just gives it right back! <laughs> yes, keep folding the ancient and Spanish dollars over right. they never fit in the slot <laughs> oh. this, this curse is rough <laughs> And so, like, we get the story. This guy finds one of the coins. He dies mysteriously. And then, like, his son finds the coin and gets hit by a horse or something. <laughs> the horse walks up and punches that, him right in the is face. Is that a common occurrence in Maine? Gotta <laughs> <laughs> watch out for them. That's, that is bad luck to have a horse punch it you. It sure that is, That would be yeah. awful. And then it was, like, some guy's friend borrowed the coin and wanted to explore this mystery further. And he fell into a pit or something like that. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, he was digging for treasure. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's good luck, Should really. So it's right, yeah. an interesting story. It's like, oh, good. Well, the horse pushed him in. Right, yeah. 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 <laughs> Cantankerous horses. It's like, oh, good. We're finally getting to a decent story. And then she dives right into, there are six treasure spots in Cumberland County, Maine. There are Jewel Island, Great Chesapeake Island, Richmond Island, Cushing Island, Johns Island, and God Island. The three spots in Hanock. Like, she just keeps going. It's like, you had something going, Patricia. <laughs> Don't go back to the islands. She could have just put a map in the page and let 
you to explore it later. <laughs> oh yeah, just put little X's yeah. wherever you need the treasure to Absolutely. be. Like, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if she worked for like the Maine's mm. tourism board. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, hmm, I sure do love reading about islands I've never been to and probably never will. <laughs> She's probably embedded with the local tourist big tourism. And, yeah, absolutely. Big, big They're lobbying Maine. for yeah. big for Maine. <laughs> <laughs> for Maine's uh, loot finding tourism. One of the places Captain's Kids Treasure can be found just outside of Magical Forest Amusement <laughs> Park. <laughs> <laughs> Conveniently located by three major brand hotels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I fell asleep reading this book. Oh, yeah. you can only read so much about islands of Maine before sure. you. Sure. What could she have done better? What did you want this book to be? I wanted it to be pretty much story after story of here's a just one island. Let me just mention one island here real quick. <laughs> I'll be fine with that. I'll meet you halfway, Patricia. <laughs> And here's the ghost story or treasure story associated with it. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Okay. You don't have to give me giant chunks of every island you've ever heard of. This book could have been cut in half because of the amount of filler that she put in. Could I see the book? So besides the gold coin, was there any other loot actually found? There's stories of stuff being found. There are a few good stories, and pretty much just all of them are rumors. And she says, and treasure was found here, but that she never actually gives hmm. what the, the treasure is. Yeah, she it's like, if, deep enough. Mm. if there actually was treasure found, tell me that story. Don't tell me the the myth behind it. Right, so it was a very surfacey yeah. treasure delve. She, she really well, that, try. that kind of makes sense with what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the bibliography right now, and a, a lot of it is other books like this. Mm. Algonquin Legends of New England, Pirates and Privateers of the Americas, New World Shipwrecks, which sort of seems like it's more books that are like this as opposed to looking at newspaper records and that kind of thing, which, based on her bibliography, she didn't really dig too deep at it yeah. looks like, it seems anyway. Nothing personal, Patricia. I'm rooting for you, Patricia, here. I'm doing the best I can. Okay, so really what it should have been was an authoritative source on the locations of plausible <laughs> buried at some time prior to the writing of this book. Does she ever give any plausible places for One-Eyed Willie's treasure by any chance? Oh, she'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> Nor will she ever say die. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the best thing about this book, which you hated so thoroughly? There were, again, a few good stories. What was the best story that you remember? Pretty much just the premise of two or three of them was just like the pirates had to abandon their treasure on this island real quick because they were being chased. And so they just had to leave it there. Like There was one. <laughs> Sorry, just, oh, we're chased. We better get really close to land. Get off. <laughs> Not for a <laughs> while. Our treasure. <laughs> then leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, the captain of the other ship only has maritime authority. And once once <laughs> the pirates on land, that's, he's out of jurisdiction. Curse so. jurisdiction. He has to wait for him to go back Curse on the boat. You pirate boys. <laughs> he needs to go back to England, pick up the marshal, bring him over. <laughs> <laughs> but there was like a, a couple stories of like pirate kept his wife with the buried treasure so that he could come back for her later. He never did for whatever reason. So they and never now, dug her up. And well, now diamonds her- are a woman's best friend. I guess. <laughs> And now her ghost haunts that treasure if anyone tries to find it. And so, like, there's a few stories of, like, ghosts scaring people or, like, okay. trying to protect treasure. Okay. Uh, listeners, if you would like the book, I'd be happy to send it to you. I don't need it back. But we're going to bury it on an island outside of the only town in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and we're going to provide a list of possible islands on Wikipedia that you have to go to to find it. Use the clues you've heard in this episode. <laughs> oh, yes, if you, yeah, if you listen very carefully, we mm-hmm. have laid everything out you need to know to find this book. That might be the shortest segment you've ever had for one of your books. Yeah. So it's partially a geography I don't book think of Maine. He finished it. Yeah, that's exactly. That's what really it is. what we're dealing with here. Are, are there maps in the book at all? Uh, no, no uh, maps. That seems like a misstep. This is a book about this? lost loot, and there's no maps. Hmm. This. So once again, Patricia is providing a massive long list of islands. The main islands are Duck Island, Appledore, and Hog Island, which we heard before. She just loves to repeat them. <laughs> Malaga Island. Smutty Nose Island and Ooh. Cedar Island. The Lunch. New Hampshire Islands are Star Island, Lungi or Londoner Island, White Island, and Seavey Island. Actually, the number of islands changes with the tides. At high tide, <laughs> there are eight islands. White and Seavey become one island. At low tide, there are nine islands as White and Seavey separate. And as hard as it is to believe, grass grows on this narrow strip of land that is often under the sea. Couple things, Patricia. At low tide, you would have one island because the ocean has gone down. <laughs> so two islands would become one. At high High tide, as the ocean currents rise, that would create two islands. So get your facts straight. And also, no one cares that grass grows there. <laughs> <laughs> 
grass grows there. Oh, thank heavens Patricia was here to provide me with these solid facts. Maybe that's what she needed to... In deciding whether something's yeah. an island or not, there needs to be grass there. That's true. That's, I hadn't that's thought of that before, part. but maybe that's... I a, doubt that. A contingency <laughs> upon the identification of an island or not. Now you're just lashing out. I know Patricia yeah. hurt you, but yeah. you don't have to lash out. Bro. And I like, can understand your confusion between mm-hmm. the either nine or eleven islands... Yeah. However many you decide. The groundskeeper comes to Moa is no longer an island. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed your book, Bryce. Book recommendation fan there. <laughs> so, The City at World's End by Edmund Hamilton. Edmund Hamilton is a contemporary of Ray Bradbury, so kind of that same time frame. Similar ideas talking about kind of futuristic uh, societies, what they might look like. But what we have in the city at World's End is a quiet Midwestern town of about 50,000 people during the Cold War where a super atomic bomb goes off directly over top because, of course, this quiet Midwestern town is the site of an underground research facility oh, that's okay. doing atomic testing. <laughs> and so the super atomic bomb goes off. All that happens is the people are shaken. So... They continue on, and what? in the course of a day... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what ended up happening? Here's the here's the physics behind it. Apparently, when a superatomic bomb goes off, it knocks a certain perimeter through space-time continuum okay. into another time. It totally oh. transplants the entire vicinity That's into a, a futuristic premise. idea. Okay. Oh. So they find themselves millions of years later okay. in a futuristic Earth, okay. barren wasteland, have to find out how to survive. The sun is dying. So the Earth is cold. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the okay. sun's dying, um, and of course, this midwestern town in a, in a futuristic desert Earth. They end up exploring, find a domed city that's abandoned, move into the domed city. So the whole story is about their survival as the last fifty thousand wow. people on Earth, hmm. and how they do it, how they go about it. So he does a decent job of exploring some of the main characters. Mm-hmm. John Kensington, one of the atomic physicists, that kind of jumps to the forefront, ends up leading this population. He's a scientist in a science fiction novel from the 50s or 60s, so yeah. he has to leave. The Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The science is going to revolutionize society. <laughs> <laughs> With nothing but a slide rule. Yeah. <laughs> they have a very fun Mayor Garrison, who is the, the big jolly politician okay. character, the, the good uncle of, of the town, you know, <laughs> um, that tries his best. To, God, Lord bless him, but he's just not quite there. <laughs> <laughs> Figurehead, huh? Yeah, yeah essentially. Okay. It's all about their, their struggle to survive as the earth is cold, mm-hmm. and so they can't survive out in Old Middletown. So they move into the Dome City, and what do they name it? New Middletown! (laughs) (laughs) So they have some really interesting cultural implications, though, that kind of shadow the whole thing. It's interesting because it's very relevant to some of the cultural implications of today, Mm -hmm. of the new change, the uncertainty of the future, trusting in science when you don't quite understand it as a mass culture. They get to the New Dome City. There's technology there that they don't understand but end up adapting and using and how it influences them and their decisions, similar to how we're adapting to technology so quickly and almost at a rate that we're not understanding how it's affecting in our cultural trends. Lo and behold, though, they're not the only people alive anymore. The futuristic society comes down in a spaceship and says, was, was oh, hello, here. you poor primitives. You're stuck here without any atomic energies or advanced technologies. You still use petrol engines? And they're <laughs> laughing at them. <laughs> it turns out a historian is the only one that can communicate oh, okay. because he studies pre-atomic society. Oh, that's um, cool. So he knows English. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, right, right. So you can picture a montage of all the key people oh. learning the, the futuristic language, which is kind of ridiculous in the span of like two or three weeks. John Kensington, not only atomic scientist, (laughs) is a cunning linguist, is able to pick it up, and he is therefore now the interpreter, Uh as well as the societal (laughs) leader, as well as the atomic technician that leads the charge for technology adaption in the new society. Do you know like when this was written? I think it was the 50s. It sounds very 50s yeah. or 60s yeah, science fiction. Yeah, it's definitely, and based on the, the cars that are described, uh-huh. they're definitely 50s cars. So it had not gotten into the 60s. There were no okay. sweet Mustangs or Corvette. Because they, um, they would have mentioned them. Yeah, I know, them. yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the way you're just, you're talking about this mm-hmm. very Mary Sue of a, of a main character, that yep. really strikes me as classic science fiction. Oh, yeah. Uh, He's the hero, can do anything with enough elbow grease and attitude. <laughs> you mentioned Cold War. You were mentioning mm-hmm. this being the, the 50s. What is his political view? Because it's, it's science fiction at that time pretty much always has something to say. What is his 
political worldview and what is he trying to say through this book? I, you know what? It didn't strike me too strongly of his political view. I mean, there oh, okay. was a little bit of opinion about Soviet Russia and just the fear that's associated with mm-hmm. that, but he didn't dive too deep into politics. It was more of a view of the American society or the American go get them attitude that oh, can accomplish okay. anything. That was the message that kind of rang through because towards the end, of course, they're confronted with a societal conflict of this earth is not sustainable, so the the new government, the federal government, is no longer allowing them to live there. Okay. They're going to migrate them to a new Earth where they can live, but there's this strong attachment to the Earth and identity that they had built, mm. and they don't want to leave the Earth. Mm. And the new government says, well, you have to. By the way, the new government doesn't know what violence is. Oh! Because violence has basically been ruled out of society. <laughs> <laughs> so when they get angry, they're, they think they're extremely primitive. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so it's a last-ditch effort of a theoretical science of how to reignite the core of the earth oh. to make heat again so they can stay on the earth because the sun is dying. Okay, so okay. they end up dropping this giant bomb into the core of the earth. They don't know whether it's going to work or not. The people of earth decide in a, a sacrificial attempt of everybody's in this together, uh-huh. they don't get on the star cruisers and go off earth while they drop this bomb. They all stay on pretty much. Oh, hmm. Because if they're going to die, they're all going to go together. It was in total rebellion against the current government and what they said needed to be done. Lo and behold, in its very predictable fashion, it works. (laughs) (laughs) And they all stay on Earth happily ever after. So I think the major downside of the book is it is pretty predictable. Um, There's not a lot of catching you off guard. The most interest is in the beginning of the book when Hamilton's describing the new earth, what it looks like, some of the facets of it, how they're adapting and surviving. Mm -hmm. That's where the most captivating read is during Mm -hmm. the book. And then as it kind of gets going later, there's a romance that happens alongside the main story. It's is, very is it a greaser and then a Puerto Rican girl? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he's left in Middletown, chained to the water tower. Yeah, instead of I feel pretty, oh so pretty, it's I feel cold. <laughs> oh, so cold. Yeah. oh, so cold. Oh, so very cold. <laughs> and it's actually between a humanoid that looks like Chewbacca and, you know, the, yes. the mayor's daughter. No. <laughs> There's dance fighting. It gets pretty intense. <laughs> and it's over the hydroponic tank, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I sing a West Side Story song sung by Chewbacca now, but I can't think of one on the Darn it. Darn it. Enough of that. <laughs> did this author write other books that you know of? He did. I'm not familiar with them, though. No. Okay. Would you be interested in reading those? No. <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you come by this book then if it's uh it's grouped in with the classics list that i look at oh um, that's interesting so it's, it's not a classic i think in its own rights but it's one of the if you want to read current science fiction and understand its roots oh this is one of them. so oh, like they okay. compare it to fahrenheit 451 sure, so, sure sure yeah i do i do like reading books for that reason i, I love going back to the mm-hmm. roots that's so mm-hmm. much fun i love seeing where we got our stuff from mm-hmm. that's pretty cool now do you read lots of science fiction from this time period or is this more of an outlier for you so if I dabble in entertainment series, it's uh-huh. going to be in science fiction. Okay. Um, the majority of the material that I read is basically self-improvement, self-growth books. I'm pretty dry as a reader. <laughs> <laughs> also because I just don't have a lot of time to read. And so it's Shaw. limited. Yeah. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's Shaw. why reading in the car has become such a op- great opportunity <laughs> for me. I mean, think about it. 20 minutes commute here and back again. That's 40 minutes of reading a day. And uh, cruise control, like, it's amazing. You don't even have to think about where you're going. And I just let Anna hold the steering wheel. (laughs) How old is Anna, by the way? 14 months. Oh, perfect. Perfect. That's a good gripping age. Yeah. Yeah, Anything you put in that hand, you're going to hold on to? You know, she can't quite hit the brakes yet, but uh, we're we're working on it. Yeah. 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 So what what science fiction do you tend to do? A lot of Tolkien, Lewis, more the fantasy styles. Okay. But I do like space fantasy as well, which is Mm kind of how I would classify this. Um, The Moat in God's Eye was a, a good example of that just kind of a futuristic what could be out there and what could happen. So you're sticking more with the the more fantastical, more pulpy kind mm-hmm. of side of science fiction. Yeah, that's absolutely. fun. That's a fun side to be on for sure. Yeah, I also enjoy uh, a lot of the Sherlock Holmes books. Oh, okay, um, okay. So that type of of writing is is interesting to me as well. So like late Victorian era adventure mm-hmm. fiction. That, that's yep. a pretty fun place to be too. Do yeah. You, do you read any raffles at all? No. A guy who was a fan of Sherlock Holmes during Conan Doyle's lifetime was such a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, he wanted to make that character, but as a thief. So he wrote (laughs) Raffles, which is basically a super competent 
thief who pulls off these daring robberies, they're written by his accomplice as his Watson oh, character, who yeah. doesn't always astounded by what Raffles, Raffles is doing. It's the exact same style. It's the exact same story. Just he's the one committing the robberies. I'll have to check that out then. It's fun. It's, it's yeah. fun stuff. It's very light. Oh, book recommendation fanfare. And this time I mean it. <laughs> Pretty cool, man. That's a fun, diverse arrangement of books you have there. Mm-hmm. That's neat. Yeah. Now, you said you enjoy fantasy more than sci-fi, for the most part. It sounds, it sounds like that's mm-hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. What do you enjoy more about fantasy that, that strikes out to you? I love the creation of different worlds. Oh, nice. Um, it's something beyond what I can imagine. I enjoy learning and understanding about how people perceive what could be. Okay, okay. Um, and the, the extrapolation on mm-hmm. here's what's going on. Yeah, like to, to build a giant world and, and live in it. There's this, uh, I mean, I've been intending for a long time to read Wheel of Time series. You'll read 50 books the rest of your life. You might as well make it. I know, right? Time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting until I'm retired. Well, that, that's the thing about, about a big series is it is a real plunge, but you are going to read that many books mm-hmm. at some point in your life. Yeah. Like, I, I'm doing Discworld right now. I'm about 30 books into the 50 book series yeah. of Discworld. Yeah. They're fun to read. If, if you enjoy the series, the number of books in the series isn't going to bother you. I mean, mm-hmm. that is a, a bit daunting to start a series mm-hmm. like that, but yeah. that sounds pretty cool. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Robin Hobbs work. It's the Assassin series. So it's a medieval setting. This bastard child of the king ends up becoming an assassin for the royal family. Story of how he gets through life, basically. Really neat. Hmm. But there's a whole set of series that are based in the same world. So after you explore like six books with him, you transition to a few other characters, same world, and explore that world through their lens. Assassin's Apprentice, the Royal Assassin. Uh, then they go through like Assassin goes to series. Hollywood. Yeah, Assassin goes <laughs> <and> bananas. <laughs> assassin goes to camp. Assassin, Assassin, Assassin. Yeah, assassin yeah. at World's End. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a really intense character development behind okay. Robin Hobb's series, as well as a lot of the other series that I like to read. So you're looking for a long series then with that mm-hmm. kind of development. Yep. Two episodes ago, I did a, a fantasy book as my book, and it was mm-hmm. Seventh Son by Orson Scott Card. Okay, it's <laughs> colonial fantasy, which Ooh. I found interesting. It's based on colonial America, yeah. but it's a fantasy setting. Yeah. Do you enjoy the weirder fantasy settings, or do you tend to enjoy, like, generic fantasy with orcs, goblins, and just sort of we're in medieval world, or do you have any preferences on that? I don't have a preference, but the story has to be good. There needs to be a good plot, well-developed, that captures my attention. So I enjoy very much predicting what's going to happen. Okay. But if it doesn't go there, it needs to be ultra-heroistic. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, the good guy has to be up against some really bad stuff and come through, and it has to make me feel good. <laughs> so okay. I'm not going to read it. Do you, you want, you want <laughs> your fantasy to still be uplifting. Yeah, absolutely. I don't like the dark so hero So not Game stuff. of Thrones or no, so Ulrich much. or... Yeah, no, okay. or Clifford. Like, that's just <laughs> yeah, heavy Cl- for oh, me. Yeah, the that, Big Red Dog? Yeah. 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 Have you read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy? No, I haven't yet. Oh, um, buck a room. I've been working through Narnia again, actually, so I'm, Drop you know, I go back Space to Space Trilogy. Well, yeah. and I'm taking my wife through Narnia, so... Drop it. <laughs> <laughs> She's on her own. <laughs> So I brought in a book today for our Halloween special that is very, very precious to me. This is one of my favorite books that I own. This is Witches of Pennsylvania, Occult History and Lore by Thomas White. So my ex-girlfriend is in that. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Witches. Witches. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this book is really, really precious to me because as a kid, like most kids, I read lots of books about cryptozoology and UFOs and gangsters and murders. And as I'd read these books, I would think to myself, man... None of these stories take place in Pennsylvania. Our state is so <laughs> boring. There's got to be some horrible here. things that have happened in Pennsylvania. Yeah, like, Let's I, find them. I would look and try to find, and there's nothing. Like, we didn't have Chernobyl. We don't have barely any Bigfoot sightings. I mean, Probably we, a good thing. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, thank nothing, nothing interesting. No, this, mind you, this is nine-year-old Sam, okay? This, this oh, is not 28-year-old oh, oh, Sam. Okay. I would read these books. I'd be so disappointed. There's nothing interesting. If you read the weird Pennsylvania book, even the stuff in that book is, like, really pretty tepid and mm. not particularly interesting. It's kind of like the Lost um, Loot of Maine. It is. It's very, much, <laughs> it's very much just like it. Which I was going to say, if one of these witches ended up on an island, they'd be sandwiches. Oh! Oh! Except for during low tide, in which they're grass witches. <laughs> <laughs> but I was at a library sale a few years ago. I saw this book, Witches of Pennsylvania, and I noticed it's over 100 pages long, so I thought, even if only 50 pages of this are good, it's still about Pennsylvania, and it should be at least kind of interesting. <laughs> And lo and behold, it was. Turns out Pennsylvania does have a very weird and very rich tradition of witches, which I had never heard of until I read this book. Huh. 
We have a witch tradition that goes all the way back to William Penn, the founder of <gasps> Pennsylvania. Oh. He, everyone's favorite Pennsylvanian. <laughs> Don't ruin William it's Penn in the for me. No, no, this is great. This okay. is great. I love this. So William Penn in 1684 presided over the witchcraft trial of one Margaret Matson. Her neighbors complained that she had bewitched their cattle and <laughs> that she had showed up at her daughter's bedside in spectral form, wielding a knife to attack her. And they had this secondhand evidence that she was a witch. She was also one of the remnants of the colony that was there before William Penn founded it, which was New Sweden. So she was also an outsider, too. Mm. You know those Swiss. He <laughs> did Swiss. Wrong country. <laughs> they're, they're all Europeans. They're you know. just full of holes, just like your <laughs> argument. <Yeah. laughs> Whatever you think of them, their flag is a huge plus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flag humor is the best kind of humor. <laughs> I now have a fan theory that because she bewitched cattle, that is why cows can predict the weather now. Please tell me more about cows predicting the weather. Yeah, if you have like a hundred more, tell me more. If, if you have a hundred cows, eighty uh-huh. percent of them are laying down. Uh-huh. You have an eighty percent chance of rain. Mm-hmm. What if you have a ten percent chance of rain? Ten cows. Thank you. Yep. Really? Oh, and you so can take ba- it to the bank. Yeah. This is amazing. This is a theory that people have is that cows can predict the weather mm-hmm. based on the oh. number of cows laying down versus standing up. Mm-hmm. Has it been proven or is it just a wonderful theory? Let's not talk about facts again. <laughs> Don't be bringing your <laughs> science. Oh, yeah. this, this is Book Report's podcast, yeah. fella. Hit bricks. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, William, William Penn presided over this woman's trial. Before the, the trial ended, he talked to the jury and told them what kind of charge they could give her. They found her guilty of having the common frame of being a witch, but not guilty in the manner and form she stands indicated. In other words, hmm. she's guilty of acting like a witch, but we don't think she actually is one. You know? <laughs> or, or rather, the precedent is we can't know for sure she's a witch. We just right. know that she looks like one, basically. <laughs> So she was fined 50 pounds, and she was given back to her husband to ensure that she had six months of good behavior. (laughs) And that's it. (laughs) (laughs) So William Penn basically set the precedent that you can't find somebody guilty of witchcraft. You can find them guilty of acting like a witch. The Salem Witch Trials were only a few years after this. Right. And and one of the the big things was William Penn was a Quaker, and Mm -hmm. he founded Pennsylvania with the idea of religious freedom, which attracted all kinds of crazies from Europe. (laughs) 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 You know, like like the... And that's where we get Pennsylvania Dutch from, is Mm -hmm. those were a bunch of the people who were being persecuted in Germany who came over. They were persecuted for being Quakers. They were also persecuted for practicing pretzels. Pretzels. Yeah. For practicing pretzels. You just don't twist them the way that they <laughs> twist them. That's just unhuman. Yeah, they don't twist like we twist last summer. Right. I mean, come on. Absolutely. That's not Let's all right. twist again. <laughs> I did last summer. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're founder Chubby Checkermeyer. <laughs> <laughs> that brought a whole bunch of people. And what they practiced, besides pretzels, was also <laughs> the religious practice of powwow, which is Pennsylvania Dutch magic. They had a book called The Long Lost Friend, another book which was called The Sixth and Seventh Books of Moses, which were supposedly apocryphal books from the Bible. Mm-hmm. And they would use these two books to be able to practice magic and to be able to give people cures, to help people find lost objects, and to, to be able to help people. It was also used to put hexes on people and to curse people and keep them from being able to have kids, to give them body pains, that kind of thing. Huh. Supposedly. Fun thing about this subject, it's a combination of history, local traditions, superstition, and the occult, which just makes us this fun melange to read. It's just, it's a really fun subject to read about <laughs> because there's so much crazy in this book and so much history combined together. Mm. I'm personally a big fan of history being mixed with crazy. Um, <laughs> you have this tradition of powwow, and that divides in half between being good magic and bad magic, which is pretty common throughout the world, even in Christian circles at this time because science is so mixed in with magic where Mm. if you're curing somebody by giving them a necklace made of living worms and then saying a charm over it, that's medical science at the time. So you can't really say, oh, you're practicing witchcraft. (laughs) But if they're using it to hex people and to keep people's goats from giving milk, then they're a witch. Mm. So if you're using powwow Mm. for good, you're basically a doctor at this point in time. (laughs) If you're using it for evil, you're a witch. So throughout this book, we're going to be using the term powwower for being a good person and a witch for using it for evil, basically. Gotcha. Powwow is also an Indian tradition. It is. Is, is this a different powwow? It has nothing to do with it, okay. apparently. Yeah, it's just this weird this mm. weird coincidence that's named that same thing. Yeah, mm. I don't really think there is a, a connection, at least according to this book, anyway. This 100-page book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good book, but it is an introductory book. Like, it is only 100 pages long. He's got a great bibliography. I mean, any book in this bibliography would be fantastic to pick up as a, an accompaniment. But for 100 pages on which 
witchcraft lore, this is a really fun book. <laughs> yes. uh, it, it is a bit light. I wish he would have gone more in depth on a few places. That's the only problem I have with this book is I want it to be 100 pages longer. Um, <laughs> there, there, there are certain places where I wish he had given more information. Later in the book, he talks about there being places that are commonly associated with witches just as urban legends, but there's no actual proof witches ever did anything there. Supposedly there are paranormal experiences there, and he doesn't go into what they are, oh, probably okay. because you can't because it's an urban legend. Well, and what, what's this guy's name? Um, the guy who wrote it? Yeah. Thomas White. Well, listen, Thomas, you can learn a lot from Patricia Hughes. <laughs> Just because you don't have evidence that something happened doesn't mean you can't write a whole book yeah, about the it. The other That's problem right. was there weren't, there weren't enough lists of islands oh, uh, off oh, of Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're in Lake Erie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so as the, the practice of powwow among the Pennsylvania Dutch grows and grows, it starts becoming more of an accepted thing. If you live in a Pennsylvania Dutch community, that is your doctor. And then we get into the 1920s and the 1930s. Mm. where there are a series of hex magic related murders in Pennsylvania. <gasps> the first one is in 1928 and it is the murder of a Nelson Raymeyer. He's murdered by three people named John Blymeyer, John Curry, not to be mixed up with his cousin, Tim Curry. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Elijah. <laughs> this is my only number. <laughs> uh, and a man named Wilbert Hess. Get back to the murder. Come on, guys. Reel it in here. Geez. I expect you to take the witch murders of 1920s seriously. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Caleb. I didn't know you were so invested. Uh, <laughs> the, the main person who, who murdered him was John Blymeyer, and he was also a practitioner of powwow from the age of seven. After he lost two of his children to childbirth, he started getting a bit paranoid, and he went to a practitioner of powwow that he looked up to named Andrew Lennart. And Andrew Lennart said, it's somebody you know that's put a hex on you that killed your two children. Now, Andrew Lennart, this guy, has a terrible track record because two of his previous clients killed their husbands because he told them that they put hexes on them as well. So this is not somebody you want to go to. Or he has an amazing track record and got it right three times. I'm not sure. Um, but John Blymeyer is able to track down and figure out that it must be Nelson Ray Meyer, which was a man he knew since he was a child. Another power says, the person who has put this hex on you, you need to get a lock of their hair, and you need their copy of the seventh and sixth books of Moses, which is the, the magical book mm -hmm. for Powell. And if you get those and bury them, the hex will be gone. So he and these other guys who also blamed Nelson Raymeyer for the hexes that were on their lives and their, their misfortunes, their farms going bad, that kind of thing, they all go to his house. While his back is turned, they all attack him. And in the struggle, somebody accidentally or on purpose strangled him to death. <laughs> um, Whoops! Yeah, yeah. At which point they decide you know what? We kill them. The hex is probably broken. We'll just leave. <laughs> Bury all the uh, hair. <laughs> Bury all the hair. <laughs> you go. But these guys were quickly found out. They made the mistake of visiting his ex-wife and asking for directions to his house <laughs> shortly before he was murdered. Sure, yeah. Um, so the trail quickly led back to them, and John Blymeyer and John Curry both served life sentences, and Wilbert Hess actually got out after 10 years and served in World War II. After this murder, like the satanic panic in the 80s, yeah. you have a hex panic in the 1920s where every crime in Pennsylvania, they look, okay, I bet it has something to do with witchcraft. <laughs> mm. So I went to the bibliography to see what he has to say about this, and there is almost an entire page of headlines from the New York Times yes. <laughs> about witchcraft crimes and crimes people want to be witchcraft crimes. So here's just a selection of these. Boy denies joining in witch killing. Charm book throws light on witch trial. Convicted of witchcraft. Death of five babies laid to witch cult. Fear of witchcraft leads to murder. For Sandy Tess and Hex case. Hex slayer gets life. Hex treatment seen in death of woman. Hence federal action in witch murder. Slain girl wore hex charm. Superstition in Pennsylvania. Third witch killer convicted at York. Witchcraft trio face trial today. I mean, it just goes on and on. Like, I imagine uh, these newspapers spinning, coming closer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just imagine, this is the New York Times. This isn't a right. Pennsylvania newspaper. This right. is national headlines trying In to make 20s. every wow. single and probably murder. the newspaper of the nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're trying so hard to connect it. Like, there was a full-on panic about Pennsylvania magic. And I'd never heard of this until I was an adult. <laughs> right. I mean, nine-year-old Sam would have loved this stuff. Seriously, uh, get with it, history curriculum. It is. <laughs> it's, it's a real, honestly, it's a real Why were we not learning shame. about this? Yeah, I, how many times have we learned Pennsylvania history? Yeah, right. Like, we have, what, what do you learn about? The years? Erie Canal? Yeah. Mm. Erie Canal. Yeah, we learned about William Penn. Never the cool stuff, yeah. tell you that. <laughs> that's I mean, for sure. Uh, his father was indebted by the king. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> how many kings are you indebted to, Sam? Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> king George II got nothing on you. <laughs> There are several more murders that actually are involved with people doing powwow, with varying degrees of actually a bit mattering that they were powwowers or not in the case. What was the spookiest thing that happened? Probably the spookiest thing. 
probably the, the murders. And then later on in the book, he gives those urban legend sites. And I, I think this, it's not really witchcraft, honestly, but I think it's honestly weird and spooky and awful is that there is a headstone for a woman named Mary Black in a cemetery in Lawrence County. Shout out Lawrence to County. Lawrence. Lawrence County! Yeah. L, big LC! You made the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that, and that's the other fun thing about this book is it's all Pennsylvania, so yeah. it's names I've heard on school closures and that kind of thing. You know? So it's, it's like, oh, I, I've heard of Shul Kill <laughs> County. You know? <laughs> Shul Kill. You know? that, that, that's that was my kill, by the way. Is it? Yeah. School Kill. There, that's I said it right now because <laughs> I'm editing that back in. But this woman was named Mary Black. Her headstone was continually, like, vandalized, and people would try to dig her up because there was an urban legend she was a witch. There is absolutely no proof this poor woman was a witch. There's nothing to support that. It's just her name is Mary Black, so everybody assumes she's a witch, pretty much. Oh. So they had to remove her headstone and give it to the local historical society where it's kept locked up so nobody can get to it. <gasps> so this poor woman's headstone can't be with her body because people keep messing with it. I mean, <laughs> just, what? That's and she, and she wasn't a witch. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing there to, to make. Like, I found that personally kind of spooky. Like, she's, the idea of just this poor woman, her headstone isn't there because people are awful. She's as innocent as a Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, now I'm rethinking this. Swiss. Yeah. I do want to just give you one quick thing I, I thought was kind of cool. As I'm reading this, like, how far away are these places from me? There's one in Berwick. Of course <gasps> there is. Yeah. Is it a meth Every lab? <laughs> <laughs> Berwick has a witch road. It's called the Witch's Triangle. And this is just a, a quick excerpt from the book. The small patch of woods that makes up the triangle is located close to a golf course. One version of this legend claims that three young witches were captured there by local farmers while engaged in a ritual in the 1800s. Golfing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a misunderstood sport in its earlier years. Hole in one is a magical thing, Bryce. Oh, you're right. The trio of witches was hanging from the trees, and since that time, the area has been cursed. It's reportedly been used by the Ku Klux Klan, satanic cults, and of course, covens of witches. A nearby abandoned house was said to be the site of a gruesome murder-suicide in which a man slaughtered his family. The implication is that the evil of the witch's triangle drove him to commit the crime. Of course, there is no evidence that any of these events actually happened, but it has not stopped the parade of legend trippers, which are people who go to urban mm -hmm. legend sites and try to get spooked out, who have come over the years to interact with the supernatural. So there is a fun little witch's triangle, which has absolutely no history behind it, <laughs> or anything cool that happened there, and it's the coolest thing that Berwick has. But it's neat to see places that I've heard of, locations right. that are near my house, mm -hmm. and associate with something scary. I mean, that, there's something really fun about that. That's kind of what I think Halloween is all about, Charlie Brown, is... <laughs> <laughs> Everything being a little bit scarier, but it's still your town. There's a safeness to that. There's mm -hmm. a safeness to running around your town dressed as something awful. That's pretty fun. And that's kind of what this book is for me is mm -hmm. crazy local folklore, a few terrible mass killings, some hilarious headlines, and William Penn just being an awesome man. I mean, that's <laughs> that's Pennsylvania to me. There you go. Yeah. Put him on the hero list. <laughs> Are you familiar with the Molly Maguire stories? Ooh, yes. So the Molly Maguires were a family a of Irish, Irish in the coal cracking region of Pennsylvania. Okay. Ended up leading... Oh, the, the Molly Maguires, the gang? Yeah. No, tell me more, tell me more. Yeah. Well, so they had kind of stood up against the robber barons of the coal region. They get imprisoned after they'd murdered some people. Whoops. Um. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. But Just so, Irish. <laughs> so they're, they're placed in, in a cell uh -huh. in, I, I think it's Jim Thorpe, actually. Uh, it's somewhere near it, Jim Thorpe, Lehigh that, area. Yeah. And so they're placed in a cell, and one of the Molly Maguire men leaves a handprint on the cell. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And no matter how many times now they paint over it, the handprint comes back. Mm. And so, that is pretty cool. Supposedly yeah. he said, like, until I'm proven innocent, my handprint won't leave this wall. But yeah. I have some shirts like that. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> stains will not come out. Yeah. <laughs> they only appear in a certain light. <laughs> <laughs> One night a year, the, the crayon marks come back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As many listeners know, actually just one listener, as Rockasaurus Rex knows, <laughs> August 1st was... A meteorite came and hit. <laughs> <laughs> August 1st was our last time that we put our episode on SoundCloud. We definitely just moved away from that. And so I wanted to be a good host and sent Rockasaurus Rex a personal message oh. saying, just wanted to give you a heads up. We won't be posting here anymore. Mm -hmm. As a side note, please don't ever tell us who you are. I'd be devastated to find out that you're one of our moms or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I was hoping for a reply, and we got one. All it was was a YouTube link, and I was like, oh, no, it's going to be a video of them revealing themselves. Like, this is the best. <laughs> Maybe crack up. Uh -huh. Sound of Silence by Simon Garfunkel. 
<laughs> oh, I love them even more now. Oh. Rockosaurus Rex, you are surviving the Ice Age, my friend. That's so, all there is to it. Thank you, whoever you are. I hope you're still listening. It's not going to be on SoundCloud, though. If you do want to listen to us, just like Rockosaurus Rex, and be fantastic, just like whoever they are, you can find us on iTunes and YouTube. Definitely check us out. Subscribe to us. Give us some positive ratings on iTunes so people can find us better. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash bookreportspodcast. You can email us at bookreportspodcast at gmail.com. Got it right this time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you can find Sam at Skullduggery in the smoke.blogspot.com. You're actually turning that into a book, you said, right? I am, yes. I'm, I'm compiling all of the past blog postings about Constantinople's Northern Shore, and I'll be putting that together for a book, just like I did for the last ones I did before. This is effectively book two out of four books about Constantinople that I'm writing. Uh, they'll be compiled together into one book when I'm all done. Right now I'm in the illustration stage, so I've been having the fun of doing these illustrations and taking period illustrations of Constantinople and making people into orcs and dwarves and gnomes and ogres <laughs> and stuff like that. Cool. That's been really fun. Yeah. I want to thank our guest, Caleb Swartz, for stopping by. Yes, thank you very us. much. Thank you for having me today, guys. It was a lot of fun, and enjoy hanging out with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed having you on the podcast as well. Great to have a guest who's actually celebrated Halloween. That's always... Because <laughs> we couldn't. <laughs> we couldn't. We live like Harrison through you. Uh, you guys can come knock on my door tonight. It'll be fine, you know? <laughs> Will and behold, though, they're not the only people alive anymore. Okay. Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> Spoiler alert! I thought you said William Defoe. Yeah. I was like, oh, all right, this is they're getting good. Hey, only... <laughs> <Hi>, everybody. <laughs> well, let me tell you where everybody went. <laughs> Quick William Defoe impression, Bryce? Evan? All I know is him from Spider-Man, so... Uh... <laughs> Spider-Man? Yeah. <laughs> really? How that's, dare that's you? Your... That's my word. You, you haven't seen Speed 2 Cruise Control? <laughs> oh. Was Keanu Reeves in that? He was. And he did Sandra not come Bull. back. He, just okay, Sandra yeah. Sandra yeah. Yeah. Guy. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best William Defoe is Boondock Saints. But anyway, so William Defoe does not make an appearance. Uh, sorry to disappoint what listeners. A, well, well, this book is terrible now. I know. Is Worse that where you stopped reading? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's no William Defoe. <laughs> There's a whole <laughs> stack of books <laughs> next to Joe's bed that just have a sign with a picture of William no Defoe. Defoe? That no Defoe. Yes, no Defoe. No <laughs> Defoe. <laughs> Enough of that. Yes, so they're not the only people on Earth. Yeah.